Hey, man, the, the name of the service this morning is Gideon. <laughs> the power in God's numbers. Uh, Gideon, the power in God's numbers. And we're going to, obviously, we're going to talk about Gideon this morning. Um, but I want us to, to be on one accord. Today we're discussing uh, in Judges, the book of Judges, which is the Old Testament, uh, Judges uh, chapter 6 and 7. And where we're studying Gideon. And anytime we study the Old Testament, uh, we have to bridge the gap uh, between the Old and the New Testament so that you'll understand some things are different from the Old Testament to the New Testament. One, Jesus hadn't appeared yet. So you have to understand that. And, and Jesus had not come at the time uh, these things happened, and he didn't come to save us from sin. So they didn't, of course, have the Holy Spirit reside in them. They had the Holy Spirit come in and out, uh, came through the prophets. And so they, they, got the, they had prophets come and give the messages that the Holy Spirit gave the prophets. But nobody had the Holy Spirit reside in them forever and ever until uh, after Jesus had come. And so we want to give the Lord a round of applause this morning because we have access to this Holy Spirit all the time through Jesus. Even in our good and bad times, he is with us, encouraging us. And so God sent, he would send the prophets to relay the message. He would send the prophets to give them understanding, tell them, thus says the Lord. And we're just speaking about Gideon's preparation for his encounter with the Midianites. Uh, Gideon, you can talk about Gideon all day. There's so many things that happened in his life that you can talk about, but we're talking about his encounters with the Midianites. Uh, the Israelites, of course, were the chosen. They were the chosen people of God, not because they were special, but because a special God chose them. And so what does that make us understand? We're, we're not special. We're only special because of God and because of the Holy Spirit that resides in us. And so the Israelites were chosen children of God. Um, God first revealed himself through them. He showed favor on their lives. The favor is his presence. And so anyone who chooses, who God chooses uh, to save and accomplish something through us, anyone who has that favor has favor of God upon their lives. That means we have the favor of God upon our lives, not because everything is going perfect in our lives, but because we have a perfect God in our hearts. Amen. So 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 the favor didn't mean that we wouldn't have troubles. How many people have had troubles in their lives? Challenges, trials, struggles. Anybody had struggles? All of us have. It just means that we're blessed because the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, his Holy Spirit resides in us. And so to know that is to know where your blessings truly come from. To know, and, and so the Israelites, Israel was rebelling against God. They were rebelling against God, and God allowed them, because of their rebellion, to be oppressed for many years. They were oppressed under Pharaoh. You know the scripture about Pharaoh in Egypt and let my people go and all of the Well, this is after the, the Pharaoh had let them go. This is after God brought them out from under the oppression of Egypt. Um, God finally provided for the Israelites. He provided for them for a lot by allowing uh, them to be broken from the oppression that Egypt had over their lives. But they still didn't listen. They still didn't listen to him, even though he he gave them his holy word. They would not listen to him. They did not listen to him. And to not listen to God is considered what? Sin. And all sin is not good. All sin is what? Evil. So the consequences of them failing to listen to God, the consequences of them failing to follow God's uh, commandments or ways that he had for their lives is where we're at. This is what we're reading in Judges chapter 6. And I want you to be blessed by this because God has a purpose for us, but we have to understand what the purpose is. So Judges 6, this is our brother Gideon. This is talking about our brother Gideon. But Judges 6, chapter 1, it says this, The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, 
and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. So as a result of them not listening to God, the Israelites were put in the hands of the Midianites, uh, who again um, oppressed them just like Egypt oppressed them. And so the Midianites are described, they're described as a large group. There's, there's lots of them. There's tons of them. Uncountable. Uh, they're talked about like the num uh, as numerous as, the, I mean, they're camels. Their camels are talked about as numerous as the sands on the beach. This is the camels, not just the people on the camels. And so verse 2 says this, because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. So basically, they set up shop. Uh, in places where they could hide, where they could hide from the Midianites. The Israelites are trying to hide. And so uh, whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and, and other eastern peoples invaded the, the country. Now, this is what we want to do. We want to skip to verse 6. Uh, verse 6 says, Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. So, Watch these parallels. Watch how this works. The Israelites didn't listen to God, which is what? Sin, right? God gave them over to their sin by allowing the Midianites to, cons uh, cons to consume their crops and their livestock. The Midianites impoverished the Israelites so much that the Israelites reached out and called for God. The Midianites are of the world. And so the world impoverished them so much that they called out to God. What is that parallel? That sounds familiar like a New Testament study that we have called the prodigal son. The prodigal son, what does he do? The prodigal son takes all his wealth and goes off and squanders that wealth. And what happens? He loses everything. And what does he do? He cries out to his father. And so why is that, uh, why is that so uh, similar? Because it's talking about the Israelites. That's what the prodigal son represents, the Israelites. And so uh, the son, of course, doesn't appreciate the father and goes out and does what he does and, and rejects the father and then comes back to the father when he loses everything. This is what Israel does over and over again. They reject God. And what does it also sound like? It sounds like us sometimes. Us as believers in Jesus Christ, sometimes we forget who the provider of our lives is. And when the world attacks us because we're not listening to God, well, who do we call to? God. Same thing. And so we're not any different uh, than the prodigal son. The prodigal son is not any different than the Israelites. We're all children of God. And so uh, verse 8 through 10 this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued, rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians. And I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. And this is what happens now. Now Gideon comes in and, and it says an angel of the Lord then appears. You know, uh, we, we want to talk about this. An angel of the Lord then appears to, to Gideon. And um, this is what happens. This, this angel kind of gives him direction. This is what we're talking about this morning. It says the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash, the Abizurite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep from the Midianites. So he's trying to hide stuff from the Midianites also. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Look at your neighbor and say, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. This is what Gideon says. Gideon says, uh, pardon me, my Lord. But if the Lord is with me, why has all this happened to me? Has, let me ask, uh, with a show of hands, raise your hand if this has happened to you before. 
where you said, I mean, I know, I know God is supposed to be with me, but if he's with me, why am I going there? Can I get an amen this morning? Why, why my finances? Why my challenges? Why my, my relationship? Has any of you ever said that? Because I know I've said that before. Why, why, doesn't, why, doesn't my, why, why does the neighbor have all these things? Why can't I have all those things? Why, do, why, does, why does everybody else have, have, have everything going perfect, but I, don't, I have all the problems? Truth be told, trying times happen to all of us. The problem is, as God's children, sometimes we're looking at the Joneses and thinking nobody else has problems but us. That's not the truth. And so the truth be told, we all have trying times. Sometimes you're looking at your own household and you're not worried. You're not thinking about other people's household. And you're thinking only you have problems. Only you have tr troubles with your children. Only you have problems in your marriage. Only you have tr troubles in your household. But that's not true. It's simply not true. Trying times happen to all of us, sometimes because of sin. And sometimes because of salvation. Watch, there's a difference. You never, you don't always know why God is testing you or putting you through a test. But sometimes it's because of something you're not doing right. And sometimes because of everything you're doing right. Let me give you an example. Right now we're reading in, about the Israelites. And the Israelites, they didn't listen to God. And the result of that not listening, God gave them over to the Midianites for the attack. In the book of Job, anybody ever read the book of Job? In the book of Job, Job listened to everything. Job did everything right. Job, Job did everything right but still had te was tested with trying times. Why? Because he listened to God. So what I'm here to tell you is it goes both ways. Don't try. You can't figure it out every time. Just try your best not to sin and to walk towards God and know that in your challenges, he is with you. And so Job was tested because of his salvation. And because of his salvation, God challenged him. What does that mean? It means you'll be tested too. You're children of God. How can you have a testimony without a test? Yeah. So it happens in both ways, just not just to you, to all, all of us as believers in Christ. So Gideon continues on. He says this, you know, this is what he said before. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Verse 14, the Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of the Midian's hands. I, am I not sending you? This is where Gideon uh, begins to sound like some of us, some of us as brothers and sisters in Christ, some of us who, 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 who God is guiding. Um, you know, when we go through challenges, when we have trials in our lives, and our persecutions, and, and God tells us to do something. How many of you have said this before? Pardon me, Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. Write this down. Write this down. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. He doesn't call you prepared and all ready and full of the Holy Spirit and ready to do things right. He calls you and then prepares you. He doesn't choose, uh, mainly choose people who are qualified uh, in this world. He chooses the insignificant to do the significant in his kingdom. Gideon says, my clan is the weakest. I am the least. What do we say? We say, I don't have the money. I don't have the, stru uh, strat uh, the stature. I don't have the success. I don't know how to start a church. I don't know how to run a ministry. That's, those are some of the things I said. Well, me and my wife talked about it. She said, are you sure you want to do that? 
We all say those things. Why? Because what's in us, you know, on the, in this world, it weakens us. It makes us think we're insignificant. Well, of course we are without God. And so Gideon says he's the weakest. He says he's the least. I say that sometimes. I say, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to run a ministry. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to start a church. I, I, you know, and, and God says what? He says, perfect. That's why I chose you. That's why I chose all of you. The Midianites that Gideon was getting ready to battle were many, more than Gideon. And Gideon didn't have access to thousands and thousands of men. Gideon only had access to God. Now, the scripture describes him like swarms of locusts, unable to be counted. And so they had a significant amount of warriors to fight against Gideon. They could have destroyed Gideon. Whereas it wasn't a winnable battle for Gideon. Gideon could see it. It was obvious. He only had so many warriors, and they had an numerous amount of warriors. And so I'm sure Gideon felt a little some way about his battle that God is telling him to go into. I'm sure uh, Gideon is thinking maybe he needs to accumulate more troops. How would we do it? Well, I've got to get to, you know, uh, you know when, when God first gave us the desire to, to, to start a church, I was thinking, well, maybe we just rent a place and hope people show up. Well, how are we going to rent it? I don't know. We need some money to rent it, right? Well, maybe God's just going to drop it on our porch. And then God said, no, I don't want to drop it on your porch. I want you to use your porch. Use the house. And so Gideon felt he probably had to accumulate troops. However, God didn't want for Gideon to do that. And as we continue in the scripture, you'll understand the reason why he uses smaller numbers to accomplish his bigger task. In just a few minutes, we'll talk about that. But now, um, he assures Gideon as to why Gideon's weakness will not be the problem uh, with what the Lord is asking him to do. And um, if this is the case, if we're thinking about this, I, I'm thinking about something here. Gideon was thinking in the, in the challenges that he was having, Gideon was thinking, well, maybe I need some more people. Maybe I need to shop for some more people. Maybe I need to look for these people, accumulate these people. And uh, um, Gideon thought he was the weakest. Gideon thought he couldn't do these things. And so uh, this is what the Lord says to him. The Lord says, it gives him a reason why Gideon is important, why Gideon can accomplish what Gideon is needing. And, and uh, the Lord didn't show him tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people. The Lord says this in verse 16. The Lord answered, I will be with you and you will strike down the Midianites, leaving none alive. So God is telling Gideon, don't worry about all that. I knew that before I called you. And, and what does he tell us as believers? Don't worry about all that. I knew your needs before you knew you had needs. Write this down. You can not win a battle without God. The continuation is you cannot lose a battle with him. <laughs> Did some of you get that? Let me repeat that. You cannot win a battle without God. And you cannot lose a battle with him. What does that mean? That means the victory belongs to Jesus. It doesn't belong to anybody else. It belongs to Jesus. It's not about how you see things. It's about how things are. It doesn't matter how the things look. It doesn't matter how things seem. It just matter who's with you. Don't you get it? We should just trust God in every circumstance. There is no winning and losing. With God, you always have the victory. We can gain a church building that, that houses tens of thousands of people and not have nothing because we don't have God. Or we could lose the building we have with God and have everything. Can you give God a round of applause in the house of the Lord? Do you understand the God we serve? 
It's not about what you have or don't have. It's about your provider, Jehovah Jireh. It doesn't matter how the victory is won or how uh, you feel about the victory. It just matters who's with you. Now, to have God is always to have a victory. If you trust God and prayed to him and asked him, then whatever happens is a victory. To not know God is always a defeat. All right, so Gideon, of course, goes through this process of doing the Lord's work by destroying the idols uh, his father and other men are worshiping. And so we're going to skip a little bit further through this because I want you to get the purpose. I want you to read it for yourselves, but I want you to get the purpose of what we're talking about today. Gideon, is, he's also gaining traction. He's gaining traction on the people following him um, into the battle. And so he's accumulating more people. He's gathered about 32,000 people. And so he has 32,000 people to fight with him. How's Gideon doing? He's doing all right. They may be like the sands on the beach, the other people, but we may be able to have a dog in the fight. So Gideon's got 32,000 people. And I want to skip down to chapter 7 here so we can stay focused on the message uh, for us today, which is establishing God's power in numbers. Now, verse, chapter 7, verse 1 through 3, is, says this. Early in the morning, Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morith. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hand or Israel will boast against, against me. My own strength has saved me. <laughs> now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 men re remained. Wow. So, so Gideon was excited because he accumulated all 32,000 people. Like, we got it. We can go into this fight. We can go into this battle. And God says, you have too many men. And so the Lord doesn't want Israel in any way to think that they did it by themselves. He doesn't want them to win the battle. Be, Ooh, yeah, look what we've done. No. And so God says, no, I need you to trim it down. So he lowers their number. Doesn't God sometimes do this with us? It's like we need hundreds and hundreds. No, you need two to agree. When two or more agree. You know, I need, we need 100 people. No, we don't need 100. We need two to agree. He gives us the impossible circumstances that only a miraculous God can accomplish. Can't you see Gideon getting nervous? Can't you see Gideon saying, oh, man, I'm back down to 10,000. Whoo. All right, Lord, I think we can do this. Um, we had 32,000. Um, God, you know, we had 32,000, but. Now we went down to 20 or 22,000 left, and now we only have 10,000. Um, we might be able to accomplish it. We still have the God, God with us. And um, the Midian knights, remember, they looked, they were numerous. They were everywhere, unable to be counted. <laughs> numerous as the grains of sand. 10,000 on the seashore. I can see Gideon going through this thought process as all of us do, saying, I don't know if I can do this. Well, great, because you can't without him. We should, and then Gideon probably saying, we should be able to do it with 10,000. Maybe we'll be able to do it. We still have God with us. <laughs> Watch what happens next. Verse 4. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. <laughs> uh, hold up, God. Did you see that the sand... <laughs> On the beach. Did you see how many camels they had? Yeah, you still got too many. Well, God, I, I, I wanted to ask you when we went down to 10,000. Now, anything under 10,000, we need to talk about this. Still too many. Take them down to the water and I will thin, uh, I will thin them out for you there. If I say this one shall go with you. 
he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. I can imagine Gideon going down to the water and saying, whew, this better be right. We're at 10,000. Maybe we'll just be at 9,000. We'll be able to do it. All you guys better do what you better listen to the Lord now. <laughs> Come on, let's do things right here. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water uh, with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. Wow. 300 of them drank with cupped hands, lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. All right, so maybe God will get rid of those 300. And we'll still have 96, 9,700. We'll be good. We can fight with that. And God says, and God says, uh, the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Wait a minute, God, where there's 300 of us. How are we going to do this? I can see, look, Gideon's one of us. I know that if God tells me something, I'm, sometimes I question what he's telling me. Is anybody in here, uh, anybody in here ever had that challenge? What? What do you mean you want me to listen to my mom? <laughs> Children, y'all know what I'm talking about, right? What do you mean? So the Lord says to Gideon with 300 men, mm, I'll put the Midianites in your hands. Let all the others go home. Are you sure? You want all of them to go home? <laughs> There's a lot of them here. We can probably get a few. With So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. So he went from 32,000, lost 22,000 immediately, and went to 10,000, to a whopping 300. From easy peasy, everybody thinks it's easy, to just faith. You go from uh, having it all made, saying, oh, God is with us. Let's go, family. Let's yeah, get your spears and your javelins. Let's go to fight this. And he said, what do you mean send them home? That's a strong man right there. He's got muscles. He's big like Elder Graham. He can fight. He's big like Mark. What do you mean send Mark home? We can send everybody else home. Keep Mark. He said, no, I want him to go too. He was drinking in the water the wrong way. Male too? Come on now, he helps me. Come on, not Theo. You can't send Theo home. This is what happened. There was only 300 left. And I know he was like, man, y'all better stick together. And that's all I got to say. It's 300 of us. And so the point is Gideon goes on to defeat the Midianites. Doesn't know how it did it happen. If you watch the movie, you get a kind of general idea, but you don't know. But he defeats the Midianites, hundreds or thousands. I don't know how many people it was, but he defeats them. And here's the point in our message. Hebrews 13, 8 says this. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The numbers and the values are the same. God can do the most with the least. What does that mean? The, the reason he does not like that is because he does not want to say that you did things your own way. And so it doesn't mean you, you can have all the things you want, but that's not what he wants for you. He doesn't want it to come complete. He wants you to, to have the cow so that you can build the shoes. He's not going to give you the shoes. He's not going to give you the success. He's not going to give you the church with thousands and thousands of people. He's going to give you the opportunity to have one person. Have opportunity to have five people. He's not going to give you all the musicians and all the things you want. He's going to give you one. God doesn't want us as believers in Jesus Christ to mistake where our blessings come from. 
They all come from God. Jesus, the, 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 God did not want the, the, the uh, Israelites to think that they did the work and not realize that God was the one who did the work. God was the one who supplied their needs. That's why he didn't do it with the 32,000. Could he have? Of course he could have. But he didn't because he wants his name to be glorified, not yours. And so he knows that at times we may feel insignificant in this world, but we're bought at a price. The precious blood of Jesus Christ. Because of that, you are precious. You are valuable. Nobody can tell you any different. He wants us to know that he's always with us. He never leaves us. Our hearts have been hardened before. Anybody in here ever had a hardened heart? Anybody did not want to listen to God. Anybody did not you know, want it to retreat sometimes, wanted to just, or sometimes you just want to lay before God and not say a thing. Has anybody ever had these challenges? He wants us to understand that he's always with us. He wants us to trust him and trust him alone. And he wants you to know that he brought you here this morning for a purpose. He wants us to know that he can do more with a little than, than we could with a lot. He wants us to understand that in him all things are possible. Without him, nothing is, impo is possible. He wants us to know that we are special. Look at your neighbor and say, you are special. Mark, I saw what you did. You're special. <laughs> I see you, <laughs> uh, our family. <laughs> God wants us to know we're special family. Doesn't mean you're not going to have challenges, not trials. Doesn't mean you're not going to have persecutions, but you need to know that you're special. You need to understand that. He wants you to know that your wounds are nothing like his wounds. And by his wounds, we are healed. By his suffering, we are saved. Doesn't mean we're not going to have problems, but it does mean we're saved. He promises he'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's not something like what you promise a friend, but then if something happens and you run. This is God, the creator of heaven and earth. All things are possible because him. Everything that was made was made through him. He says that he loves you and he'll never leave you nor forsake you. You say, but I don't have money. You don't need money. I don't have success. You don't need success. Your circumstance may say you need the world, but your God says that only he is needed in your life to accomplish anything. Stop looking at your circumstances and look at your God. Your God is greater than your circumstances, but in your trial, he doesn't look like it. Your God is greater than your challenges, but in your challenges, he doesn't look like it. Your God is greater than your finances, but in your finances, he doesn't look like it. Some people see I've got a bill to pay. I've got this. I've got challenges. I've got tribulations and all these things going on. God says, I am with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Stand up and acknowledge me as righteousness. I, I need to get this better job. I need to. God, I can't go to church. I can't do this. I can't. Of course you can. I am the provider. I am the one who created you. I knew your problem before you knew them. Stop telling me how big your problems are and lift up the name of Jesus, which is a name above all names to which every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. You don't need the money. You don't need the success. All you need is Jesus. There is power in God's numbers. There are not powers in your own. And so for us, I want you to stand to your feet real quick. For us who are in Christ, we become new creations. The 
old passes away and all becomes new. We are saved not because of anything we've done, but because of everything God has done. We acknowledge him because of everything that God has done. We accept him because of everything that God has done. We may not like our circumstances. We may not like our situations. We may not know whether they were caused because of sin or salvation. But we know that God is with us and the one who is in us is greater than the one who is against us. Can you give God honor and glory in the house of the Lord? Tell your problems how big your God is. Take your problems and drop them at the feet of Jesus. I talk to people all through the week and people say, God, uh, uh, Pastor, I have this problem. I say, but you got God. I've got this. No, God, turn your head back to God. Pastor, I don't know. Uh, God, I don't know if I can get this job. You can get any job through Christ. I don't know if I'll be able to pay this bill. Of course you can through Christ. Stop worrying about your house. Your house is sanctified because you are in it. It's holy ground because you walk in it. You are blessed and highly favored because Jesus is in you. I don't know if I'll be able to do it right. You can do all things right through Christ. Stop telling your problems how small your God is. Lift up God. Make it a standard to give God first and allow him to be the first in everything you do. All you need is Jesus. That's it. When you look everywhere else, you'll find nothing but misfits and imperfect things and things that will not account to God. Only he is worthy and only he can help you. Salvation is not the question. Salvation walk is the question. What you want to do is walk with God instead of away from him. When the Israelites walked away from him, the Midianites came. The Midianites attacked them. Guess who they ran back to? God. Who do the Israelites represent? Us. What does that mean? If we don't listen to God, we get the conditions of not listening. If you walk away, you can walk away. That doesn't mean you're not saved. You can walk away. You can turn away from God, but you get the conditions of what you do. If you turn away from your protection, you lose your protection. That is your choice. God, help me. He is helping you. Who do you think turned him back, turned you back towards him? We've got to walk in a line with God. Let him be the first and the last. There is no other way. You cannot accomplish this the other way. If you want your children to be better, you be better. If you want your children to be righteous, you first be righteous. Accept nothing but what God says. I always take this precious moment for us to accept Jesus. Truly accept him. He's real. It's not a matter of if. He's weird. He's real. And only he can help your heart. Only he can help your life. He's the one who provided for you. He's the reason you have a house to stay in now or an apartment or wherever you stay. He's the reason you have life. He's the reason you're here right now. He's the reason you praise God. You don't have to acknowledge him, but you'll get the Midianites. <laughs> How many people want the Midianites attacking them? God is with us. And we've got to make him first. Let's repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus I, accept you as my Lord I accept you as my Lord and Savior. I realize that I have sinned, I that I have sinned and, fallen and fallen short of the glory of God. Glory of God. But I know that you died on the cross. For my sins. sins. I acknowledge that. that. Make me a new creation. creation. Let all the old stuff pass away. away. And let all the things become new. new. uh, Allow me to have you as first in my life. life. I acknowledge acknowledge that I am saved. saved. 
in Jesus' name. Can you give God a round of applause in the house of the Lord?